presentation is going to be on Ritz, and um, as a fan of puns, uh, I, I must say that I appreciate the uh, title of this presentation, How to Get Rid of Your Arizona Record. Very well done. Uh, two people are going to be presenting it, that's Shannon Humphrey and Frank Ong. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Shannon and Label 2 for several years, and she shares a rare distinction of probably working in some capacity or another with the most ladle firms possible, including one, two, four and five? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And is now one of our writ attorneys. And then there's Frank Ong, who um, does some interesting things in his off time, one of which is uh, betting and lifting weights. And I wanted to basically share his record weight of how much he could lift but I think he thought he took that as a challenge and he would not tell me, so we don't, we won't remember. Uh, but without further ado, we're going to start the presentation. Hey everybody, I'm Shannon. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. Let's get started because we have a lot of material to cover. All right, so how to get rid of your errors on the record. We're here to talk today about what we're finding when we get your records. So <coughs> let's go over the purpose of a writ. So there are two types of writ attorneys in Lale, okay? First, there's your senior two that writes your emergency writs and does your legal research and helps you with information um, on, on an everyday basis when emergency questions come up and you need somebody to ask a question real quick, right? And you're not sure about a principal or something like that, so then you call up your senior two attorney and if you think that your client is not being treated properly at detention or at any other hearing than when a 2-6 is set, then you would go and talk to your senior two. However, when a 2-6 hearing is set at any stage of the proceedings, it could be an RPP in the case that's been open for five years, and a 2-6 is set, and reunification services were terminated a long time ago. If a 2-6 hearing is set, then you have the right to file a notice of intent to file a writ. Okay, let's talk about why people file writs, because I know that sometimes that can get very confusing. The purpose of a writ is to facilitate review of a ju of juvenile court orders setting a 2-6 hearing. The petitioner must state where the juvenile court specifically erred. Okay, let me repeat that. You must have some idea in your mind of what the error is and it must be specific. <coughs> and when I say we, I mean the writ attorneys jointly, and there are four of us in here, we cannot overstate enough that when you file a notice of intent, the purpose is that you have a, a precise problem in mind. If you cannot specifically articulate to us what the purpose of your notice of intent is, then you should probably be having a conversation about the lack of a specific error with your client, because that's what we're here for is to address a problem with the Court of Appeal and we're going to ask the Court of Appeal to give us a remedy. Here's the second fact, the second part of that sentence. What is the, what do you mean? Uh, Can you speak into the microphone? Uh, you want me, it's not working out? Or you I need can hold to, that little piece by your I need to move it up some? Yeah, okay. All right. Is that, is that better? Is that better? Or can they not hear us? I'll let you know. Stay up here. Okay. Okay. All right. 
The next phrase in that sentence is, what is the specific relief being requested? So you're asking us to solve a problem with the judge's orders at the setting of the 2-6. We're not here to say, we don't like that a 2-6 was set, this isn't right. This doesn't feel good to me, okay? That's not what we do. We ask the court for a specific remedy. What a writ is not for. What's going on? Sorry, we're trying to fix the Skype. Okay. Does everybody have the, the layout? We're just going to do it the old-fashioned way until we get it worked out up here. Okay. What a writ is not for. It's not to retry a hearing that you thought your client should have won. Okay? You thought it was really close and you almost had it and it was a toss-up. Okay? It's a 50-50 chance we could have won. I know Steve Shinfield is sitting back there. This is for you, Steve. <laughs> um, there was a 50-50 chance and you almost won and you almost had it. Not good enough. Okay? I'll get into that a little bit more later. Quibbling over a small mistake the judge made that would not have made a difference in the outcome of the hearing anyway. Okay? That's not the purpose of a writ. Getting even with the judge, teaching the judge a lesson, sending the judge a message that he or she makes bad decisions to satisfy a difficult client, that's not the purpose of a writ. Okay? That's not what we're here for. That's not what we do. All right, moving on. Are we still? Yeah, so if they can, hand, if they can refer to their, their printed handouts in the meantime. Yes, so we're moving to the next page of the written uh, writ process that's worth right now. All right, I actually need the microphone. Uh, and uh, just to clarify, I do not lift any weights, actually. I've been <laughs> born at home. Uh, uh, I'm really out of shape. Uh, it's, not something I'm proud of. And that's why I didn't answer your question. Um, uh, but I do bet. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, do a lot of reading. Anyway, uh, my slide uh, is about understanding what's actually going on. Uh, and I mean that in the most literal sense. I think a lot of the time, um, in these writs that we read, um, we'll read the reporter's transcript, uh, and we'll read what people are saying. And uh, people often get lost in the woods, they lose the force for the trees, so to speak. Um, typically when people file their writs, and it's not our clients filing the writ, uh, what we see is um, a lot of emotion in these cases. There's a lot of hostility. People are really combative. Um, so you really want to file this writ because you want to get back at someone, or you think you're really right, and you're upset. And um, some, some of the, these times, people will come into our offices and, and talk about these cases. Um, but. In order to actually have a righteous writ, uh, you need to understand um, what's really going on outside of just the superior court level. Um, so first, technically the respondent is always the superior court. It's not county council, it's not minors council. What we're fighting, when, we, when we're fighting them as far as a writ or appeal is concerned, we're fighting them indirectly. It's only once the trial court has validated what, they, what they've said, once they've agreed with what they've said, uh, that we have uh, an appeal or a writ to work with. Um, so when we address them in our statement of facts or, uh, or in, uh, in our argument, um, it's really just to clarify um, why the court was an error. Um, and again, like Shannon said, we're pointing out errors, not disagreements with other counsel. I would go as far as to say, actually, that uh, when we do actually file the writs, because we get a lot of transcripts where we don't file writs, we, we file Glen C's, um, we feel pretty strongly about them. What's a Glen C? So a Glen C is, <laughs> good question, a Glen C is when we find that there are no issues for appeal um, after reviewing the transcript in whole. Um, and um, we have an ethical obligation under Glen, in Ray Glen C um, to not go forward with filing um, an unrighteous writ. And I'm going to jump on what Shannon said. She said, you know, sometimes we feel 50-50, we disagree with the court, that we should have won. You know, when we file these writs, we feel super strongly about them because of Enrique Lindsay. So, and we still lose. Uh, so really, the percentage might even be closer to 95 to 5, where even if the court has a 5%, like 5% of the evidence supports the court's ruling, but they articulated it well, they had a basis, um, under the substantial evidence standard at the Court of Appeal, uh, we might still lose. So it's really hard to win 
um, in these writs or in these, uh, these appeals. Um, some examples of what these errors might look like. Uh, we, see, we see a lot of misapplication of the law in juris uh, for bypass cases. Um, you know, uh, lack of nexus, uh, uh, old DV, you know, the Jesus M issue where the DV was like two to five years old. Um, lack of current risk at the, at, at the date of the hearing. Um, because by that point, you know, the, the parent is testing clean. We might have something to work with there, considering the totality of the circumstances. We also see a lot of C-count issues, uh, emotional abuse issues, um, where uh, uh, we don't see the manifestation of the emotional abuse, by you know, self-harm or uh, untoward harm to others. Um, that is the direct result of the parent's conduct, because, you know, uh, emotional issues, uh, Emotional harm could be a result of a number of issues when children are in their teens. It doesn't necessarily have to be because of the parents, which is required under 300C. Um, some other examples. Oh, failure to follow procedural. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I listed some, some WIC sections as examples. Um, what we see a lot, for example, are uh, when 388s are filed concurrent to the last review hearing. Um, so you, a 2-6 is probably about, about to be set, um, and someone files a 388, and a lot of these bench officers, um, you know, Marpet does this a lot actually, they just steamroll ahead, and they don't even set a hearing. And, and the standard for setting a hearing is most of you know is prima facie. It's a super low standard. I, I would just think that if you're, you know, if you're a smart bench officer, you, you just set the hearing and then deny the 388 and then set the 26. Often it is what it is, right? Uh, the facts we have. But if a bench officer doesn't even set a hearing, um, that's usually a pretty red, big red flag. Um, there's also 366.3. Uh, 366.3, the relative placement preference. Um, the key term here is preference. Uh, by no means is the trial court required to place a child with a relative. Uh, but what 366.3 entitles to a parent is the right to have a hearing um, to determine whether the procedural standard or the, the evidentiary uh, standards in 366.3 uh, factor in so that a child could be placed with a relative and, and that the preference actually applies. A lot of the time, again, we see bench officers steamroll ahead um, and don't even set a hearing. And of course, we have to ask for a hearing. Um, we're talking about making specific object objections. If we just ask for placement, uh, we're not really preserving much because the court could always say what it usually says, which is, uh, yeah, uh, I ordered the department to assess maternal great aunt in Wisconsin, or something like that. Uh, but if we ask for a hearing, um, we are entitled to one under 366.3. Again, we have to be specific as to our requests, or else we forfeit the issue. Uh, another example, a big one, is uh, 361.5, the bypass provisions in B1 through 17. Um, and what we always neglect is that bypass is always a two-part analysis. Uh, yeah, it's always a two-part analysis. Uh, we know most of the time it's easy to prove, it's easy for the department to prove the bypass provision under B1 through 17, um, even if it is by clear and convincing evidence. You know, once juris is done, uh, a lot of these uh, provisions are easy to prove, with the exception of maybe B10 and 13, which requires um, showing that the parent didn't make subsequent efforts to resolve those issues. Um, but the second part of that analysis that courts always gloss over is uh, the provisions in 361.5C. Uh, and we need to bring this up a lot more um, instead of just accepting that one of the B provisions uh, was satisfied. And you could still have FR ordered if, by clear and convincing evidence, um, it, it's in the minor's best interest. And that's our burden. The burden at that point shifts to us to prove that. But if we don't say anything, uh, that's not really how it's supposed to work. And if we don't uh, bring up this issue, if we bring up this issue actually, and the court steamrolls over everything anyway, uh, and just flippantly says, yeah, it's in the best interest of the child, 
uh, we may have something there as well. Another example of this is in uh, 361.5 C1, uh, if mental health is the reason for bypass under B2, uh, the statute actually says the court should order family unification services unless the department shows competent evidence from a mental health professional showing that services would not make a difference, basically. Uh, so in this case, actually, the, the burden stays with the department, which is really interesting. But if we don't say anything, um, you know, it's forfeited. Um, and finally, we see uh, C3 a lot too. That's bypass under B5 in E cases. Um, this is actually even more burden shifting, where the burden actually shifts to us and then back to the department. It, it's strangely worded. There's actually some disagreement. And uh, I would encourage everyone to bring up this issue if they see it at the trial level. Um, you can bypass uh, FR to a parent under B5 if an ECOM is sustained against them. Uh, but that can be prevented if the parent, uh, I believe it's the parent, we, we're not sure who, the bur who, who has the burden here, uh, can be prevented by competent testimony that services would prevent further abuse or neglect or that not at least trying services would be detrimental because of the child's attachment to that parent. Uh, and then the section goes on to say the department has the burden to investigate circumstances leading to re removal and advise whether FR would like would be likely to succeed or no FR would be detrimental. And a lot of the times the department doesn't do this as well. We don't hold uh, a fire under their feet, keep them accountable, uh, which I think we should, because this is a really interesting issue. I think Nicole uh, addressed this in oral argument recently. And it wasn't, we weren't really sure what the answer would be. Uh, next, uh, ICWA, UCCJEA, uh, those are actually, those are actually um, issues that are not waivable uh, on appeal or in writ, but that by no means should be why you don't bring it up. Uh, never rely on whether an issue is waivable or not. Um, UCCJEA in particular, we see a lot of steamrolling again. Uh, you see bench officers not comply with the communication requirement where they're supposed to communicate with uh, a separate jurisdiction out of state to determine uh, if they want to intervene. Uh, we also don't really see uh, the uh, express ruling whether our state is the home state in a lot of cases, um, in a couple cases. And we've done some UCCJEA writs as a result. Uh, these are express findings that must be required because UCCJEA is codified in Family Code 3400, but these are federal guidelines. Uh, we can't just go over them uh, and and uh, we can't just allow the court to make implicit findings. The court has to be very explicit about, um, about following the procedural guidelines of the UCCJEA. Um, next, if things are getting too emotional, uh, and this happened to me a lot in, at the trial level, uh, I used to tell myself to talk to the hand. Uh, and what that literally means is uh, I would just block out everyone. I would block out the... Uh, county council, the minors council, even, even the court at times, and I would just speak directly to the court of appeal, talking directly to the, to the court reporter. I think this is helpful because ultimately uh, you're going to lose. That's why you know, there's a lot of emotion usually. Uh, you're going to lose anyway. You might as well uh, go forward with the one chance you have at winning, which is the court of appeal. Um, and I just made sure that the court reporter could see my mouth. I was enunciating my words. I was speaking slowly. I was citing case law very clearly because that's the only friend you got at this point. And it's important to do this because uh, you have to realize that the court of appeal, I've heard as, as high as 90% of the cases that they get are from dependency and criminal. And that's believable. I think the majority actually is dependency. But even with that said, uh, they don't know dependency. They're, when they're making a ruling, they're looking it up for the first time to figure out uh, what is the right thing to do, what is the law. That's why it's so important to be clear, concise, and logical, because you're guiding them to the truth. Uh, I'll probably say this again at some other point, but in these cases, when, when we think we have a righteous writ, we need to wear the white hat. We need to show that we are you know, the party of credibility here. We're not, you know, 
we're not trying to deceive anyone. Uh, it's everybody else that's wrong, and be as forthcoming as possible. Uh, and that that gets reflected in the in the transcripts actually. Like you can see it. Um, finally, the only things in evidence that can be considered anyway. Uh, the only things in evidence can be considered anyway. So be the better lawyer. So we see this all the time as well. Uh, as far as the appeal is concerned, we can't refer to something that you argued that isn't supported by evidence. And this happens all the time in court. What I mean is basically don't be minor's counsel. Minor's counsel does this the most. <coughs> they basically say, oh, my client told me that you know, uh, she's still fearful of her mother or he still, uh, uh, he still thinks there's, there's drugs in the home. That, and it's not in evidence. They, it's just something that they heard outside during their confidential interview with their client. Um, and admittedly, I've done this before, uh, and I've seen it a lot. Uh, we'll say, you know, mother assures me that she'll have housing in a week. Father tells me uh, that, oh, he, he just entered a program two days ago. Just trust us, Your Honor. You know, uh, I think I've even said uh, I have it on good authority. <laughs> like, you know, super cringeworthy thinking about how like someone else must have read this at some point. Um, but, I mean, really think about what that means. First of all, I think 99 out of 100 times, a bench officer is just going to ignore what you say. So there's no point in bringing it up. Like, wear the white hat, again. Um, I mean, if you put yourself in their shoes as the bench officer, and you hear something weak like this, you already know that nothing's going to come back at you if you ignore it because it's not supported by evidence. You can't just take testimony from, uh, from an attorney uh, and base, I guess we're usually asking for a continuance when we say something like this, base a continuance off, off something that really has, has you know, no support. Um, and, and second, you know, we can't cite it. When we're writing our writs, you know, we, we might even mention it in the statement of facts, or we might ignore it because it, it doesn't make us look good. But there's nothing, we can, it just makes us look really weak as attorneys. Um, so I would encourage you guys, you know, be the better lawyer, again. Uh, and again, actually, I didn't say this earlier. I've made all these mistakes. So I'm not, this isn't an exercise in judgment where I'm pointing my finger at, at everyone. Uh, I'm, we're just trying to encourage everyone to become better lawyers because these are the mistakes I've made and hopefully we can, we can stop these mistakes together so that you know, we can have more righteous rates. Okay, so we're only on slide two, so and we have a lot more to talk about. So I'm going to actually skip ahead some since Frank covered a lot there. Uh, um, so I'm going to jump ahead to fun the fundamental red rules. Okay, we've had some situations where you all have made mistakes. Uh, filing a notice of intent when really you should have filed a notice of appeal, and you file a notice of appeal when really you should have filed a notice of intent. So very quickly, I'm going to go over with you when you should file which. Okay, a 2-6 hearing just got set. What are you going to file? Okay, all right. The case has been open for seven or eight years. You haven't seen mom now. You should have. You haven't seen mom in the past six months. You should still be on the case. However, if you are still representing mom and mom gets a notice in the mail that a 2 6 hearing has been set and this, her FR was terminated four years ago, and she calls you up on the phone and she says, Hey, I know you haven't seen me in three or four years, but. I want you to file this thing here that they're telling me about in the mail, this notice of intent. Do you do it or not? Okay. Now, termination of parental rights happens. What do you file? Yes. Okay. Disposition happens. What do you file? Depends if FR was given or not. There you go. Thank you. Very smart. Okay, mom doesn't like at disposition that she didn't get the kids back, but she got FR and a 280 was set. What do you file? Yeah. 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 Uh, notice of appeal at, ter at termination of parental rights. Notice of appeal 
uh, at this position when a parent gets up R and then notice of intent at the setting of a 2-6, which Adam Reed, I'm pretty sure you knew that. Yes. So there are four different AP forms that I'm aware of, the 800, the 820, the 822, and the 825. Can you just differentiate between those four? I'd read the top of it. I'd read the top of it for notice of intent to file writ petition and notice of appeal. And I don't get, I, I never got caught up in the numbers because, you know, for when I first started, those numbers down at the bottom were confusing. 800, 825, notice of intent to file writ petition and notice of appeal. And those, that's different from the petition for an extraordinary writ. Yes. Right. So yeah. that one we don't and, and the biggest requirement for that is 24 hours notice. Right. Oh, the, the biggest requirement for these extraordinary, the, the emergency writs, is 24 hours notice. County Council never complies with it. Uh, they tell you like five hours before they file at best. But, you know, again, wear the white hat. We should provide 24 hours notice before we file it. Okay, so real quick. Um, Frank is going to go over what the, what the filing timelines are. And those are, I, I see your question. The, the, the filing timelines are very critical. Um, I have also seen at least one or two instances where um, I've seen one or two instances where a client's legal interest was jeopardized or harmed because you filed the notice of intent too late. That's not good. Uh, I, I won't go into that extensively, but that's not good. Uh, even if they may not have had a chance, uh, a real chance at an appeal, you don't want to get that phone call from XYZ because you missed a deadline. And the notice of intent timelines, as you're about, about to find out, are much tighter and much closer in time, like days, as opposed to the notice of appeal, which typically is 60 days. And you've got a couple months there. And so quickly this time, because we have to move it along, Frank is going to go over that. Really quick, one thing oh, that oh, sorry, should be sorry. kept in mind is if, if uh, you're representing a father and his ratification is terminated, but a 2-6 isn't set because the other parent is getting continued FR, mm -hmm. you have to file a JV 800 or you can't file a notice of intent later on that issue to well, preserve you, it. To File the notice of appeal. Right. If 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 one parent gets FR but the other one does not, and no two six has been set, file the notice of appeal to preserve your issue. Also, and this is one of my pet peeves, and I'm so glad I'm in front of all of you to tell you. <laughs> after you get a reasonable services finding, but you knew the reasonable services were not really provided, but the judge makes a reasonable services finding anyway, what do you file? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go super fast. This uh, flow chart is actually in the memo that all of you received. I, I wrote this memo back in January um, because I was, again, seeing a lot of these issues. I thought it'd be great if attorneys could have this resource in court where they could just flip to something when making an argument and they had the actual authority. I, I know and I remember a lot of the time in court we say things, we argue things, but we don't know actually why that is. We don't know the authority, the case, uh, the statute. Everything in that memo should have an authority that goes along with it so that you're not making some, some baseless argument um, or request. Uh, about these timelines, uh, so the rule of thumb is forget everything here. Just file the day that the 2-6 is set. I know some of you guys have uh, courts that go till 4.30, just do it the next morning. Don't wait seven days. The minimum is seven days, but really that's not the rule of practice. Just do it immediately. Again, I'm not pointing the finger. I once filed a writ. I think, I used to think when I was in Lancaster I, that it was 10 days. And there was one case where I was like, oh yeah. Honestly, I don't think there was an issue looking back, but back then I was like, yeah, 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 this is, this is gonna be great, I'm gonna be famous. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I filed a writ after nine days, or JV820 after nine days, um, thinking, you know, I'm a day early, I'm great. Uh, of course, I'm late, and then I got a call from uh, our old writ attorney saying, like, why did you file this writ so late? 
I never got caught because I was in Lancaster. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I've made this mistake before. Again, I'm not pointing at anybody. But seven, I'm sorry, go ahead. Frank, I have a quick question, and I really don't know the answer because I didn't research this. But when you have an appeal, the period of time that you have to file the appeal, not the writ, but the appeal, differs whether you have a judge or a commissioner. Mm -hmm. Is there the same differentiation with the writ? Yes. That's actually the, the second flowchart. So it applies to writs as well. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. But basically, you have seven days uh, from the date that the 2-6 is filed, or the 2-6 is set to file a JVA 20. If your client was in court, if they weren't, the next question you ask is, do they live in California? If they do, then they have 12 days. If, uh, if they don't live in California, but they still live in the US, they have 17, 17 days. And if they live outside the country, like we see a lot of cases from Guatemala, and interestingly, we see uh, a lot from Japan, uh, you have 20, 27 days after the clerk mails the notice. Now, there are some clerks in the courthouse that, uh, that send out the notice the, the next day. They're, they're just slow on their minute orders. Do not rely on that. I actually did have one case where we relied on that, thinking, oh yeah, all the minute orders and uh, all the notices are sent out the next day. Uh, for that one particular case, the clerk sent out the notices the same day um, as, 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 the, as the hearing. So you were a day late. Um, I still went forward anyway, just so you guys know. Sometimes we just fudge things and hope for the best, because it was a righteous issue. Um, the second problem of that is, uh, was your hearing before a judge? So we have judges and commissioners. Uh, if it was, then just, if it was before a judge, just consider the dates uh, or the deadlines that you have on the left. If it was in front of someone like Padilla, Marpet, you know, the commissioners in court, uh, you tack on an extra 10 days, uh, and again, the authorities for all of these dates uh, or these deadlines uh, is included in the flowchart. Oh. Uh, the next slide just basically shows um, the timelines in a different format. Uh, you could use this as well. Obviously, it'd be a good idea to bring this flowchart, the memo in general, to court with you so that you could use it as a reference. Just leave it at your desk. Um, that's how I hope that you can use. Anyway, uh, so this is the biggest reason that I wanted to make this presentation. Uh, I, I saw this as an opportunity to talk about uh, an issue that I see more than any other issue, independency court. Um, and uh, I'm guilty of this as well, uh, mainly because I was told that this is what you do, and I saw other attorneys do it. And I'm here to quash this myth of the CYA objection, because um, it, it does nothing. Uh, and we do it all the time. So some examples of that is, your honor, I object out of an abundance of caution. For the record, mother, father objects. It, you never, I think Dennis once told me, never say for the record, because everything's on the record anyway. <laughs> but we just want it to look really nice. Uh, we withdraw our contest, but please note mother, father's objection to terminating the unification services. This is an actual quote from a transcript that I recently read. And this was a newer attorney, again, not pointing fingers, but you know, if you say something like that, you're canceling yourself out because an objection is a contest. And what's the Court of Appeal going to do, as well as opposing counsel, uh, or real parties and interests, uh, minors counsel and county counsel, they're going to say, that is a waiver. When we withdraw our contest, we're not really objecting to anything. And if you're just saying you're objecting, generally, you're not really preserving anything. I'm going to address that in a moment. I also see uh, over mother, father's objection, Your Honor, and finally, uh, we object to the court making dispositional orders. All of them. All dispositional <laughs> orders. Everything. We object. And again, that does not preserve anything because in Ray Daniel B, and this is only a recent case of just, you know, probably dozens or over a hundred cases that basically say that general objections are insufficient to preserve issues for review. The objection must state the ground or grounds upon which the objection is based. A, re a, review a reviewing court does not have an obligation to address issues not raised by an appellant because an appeal judgment is otherwise presumed correct. So again, unless you state exactly why, the Court of Appeal is just going to be like, we think they're right because they don't know any better. They don't know dependency law. 
uh, a party forfeits the right to claim error as grounds for reversal on appeal when he or she fails to raise the objection in trial court. The purpose of forfeiture is to avoid a situation where the, uh, the appellant is devoid of a factual record. This is important because when we appeal or file, a writ's basically a form of an appeal. When we appeal, we want to show that it matters to our client, that you know this isn't just a small issue, it's not a harmless error. And if the attorney is not making a record about it and just generally objects, then we don't have that factual record. Uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, Inri SB brings up two really important points. The purpose of the forfeiture rule is to encourage parties to bring errors to the attention of the trial court so that they may be corrected and application of the forfeiture rule is not automatic. The first thing that you get from this is basically that, remember, the other party in appeals is the respondent. Is, is the trial court. It's not minors council or, or county council. We're, we're fighting the trial court. Uh, and it's unfair to suddenly say surprise in the appeal, bringing up an issue that had never been brought up before. It, it goes against fairness, really. I mean, it doesn't even work at the trial level to, to not bring this up beforehand. Um, so, you know, again, we should wear the white hat. We should always show that, um, you know, we're the credible source of information. Um, and that definitely helps in these appeals. Second, yes, the forfeiture rule is not automatic. And there are exceptions. Uh, there's exceptions like, you know, due process, material issues of law. I bring up these issues all the time, these, these exceptions all the time. Because I would say 80% of the writs that I've done, they're not really preserved. The issues aren't really preserved. So what I, meant, what, what I end up doing is, asking the Court of Appeal to exercise its discretion under certain cases where they have, which is the exception, not the rule. Uh, and the second is, I just kind of manufacture a BS argument, and I totally admit it's BS. Hopefully County Council never sees this, but you know, I'll say that the, the trial attorney tangentially or circuitously preserved this issue for appeal because they brought it up like in passing at some point during the argument. And, uh, you know, hit or miss. Instead of requesting, I mean, instead of objecting determination of reunification, can you just say, my client requests continued reunification? Will that preserve your record? You should say why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, yeah. You should always be asking why. What's the answer to the question why? Sometimes how. But all we do is what all the time. It should be why and how. Um, so the exceptions, what you need to know about them is don't worry about it. Never rely on the exception, because that's all I do. That's my job, actually. Just make your record as precisely as you can. I put a ton of authority in that memo for all kinds of issues. It's near exhaustive. It isn't exhaustive, because that's impossible. But it's near exhaustive as to what can be addressed when a 2-6 is said. So you know, just make your record. Don't worry about the exceptions. So Frank has set up my can you, is this working? OK. So Frank set up my issue, which um, my issue is forfeiture. And I want to go into some specifics about forfeiture and how important it is, OK? Because sometimes we cannot write the writ because you didn't raise the issue and you didn't preserve it, OK? So I want to go over some common ways that that happens so you can be on the lookout for them. I understand that when you are sitting at council table, the client is in your ear, and the client is <laughs> and, and, you know, this <laughs> you know, now, I want to say that during those moments, it's during those moments that you miss what the judge is saying or doing and when the judge makes the mistake that we file the writ on, okay? So sometimes in, when I was in court, I would patiently say, Your Honor, can I have just one moment? And I would turn to my client and I would say, as long as you're doing that, I can't pay attention up here. And so the judge usually gives you one moment before making their findings and allows it and will say anything else from counsel. And then if your client has an additional request, then you, you say, Your Honor, you know, yes, my client wanted to say something. He's been trying to say something the whole time. Just can I have a moment? Okay, ask for your moment. But when the judge is talking, that's your time to be preserving your record and paying attention. So, forfeiture. It's failing to raise an issue or make a specific objection in trial court and then raising it for the first time on appeal. You forfeited your client's issue. 
Okay, now, like Frank just told you, sometimes if it's a fundamental issue like jurisdiction, okay, jurisdiction can be raised at any time. UCCJEA, ICWA, okay, we can try to get you over the forfeiture hurdle and say, hey, Court of Appeal, uh, we didn't forfeit this. My, even though my trial lawyer didn't say anything about UCCJEA, I'm going to raise UCCJEA and it's fundamental so they can't do anything about it. Okay. So sometimes we can help you out when you, for, when you miss a beat, but sometimes we can't, okay? So a party is precluded from raising non-fundamental, non-constitutional errors in appellate court that were not raised below. Like I said, if it's fundamental, it's fair game, and even though you, didn't, you missed it, if we catch it, we can take it up on appeal. Failure to preserve an issue in the trial court by means of an appropriate request ordinarily will preclude a party. I can't stress that enough. Okay, exceptions, which it does matter to me. So fundamental errors such as the court's jurisdiction can be raised any time. Most common forfeiture errors particularly, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Most common forfeiture errors particularly from new attorneys. Failure to state a specific law not being followed. Example. The court terminates FR services two months too early, okay? I.e., at 10 months, instead of 12 months for a child over age three, I've seen this multiple times, okay? But I couldn't say anything about it because you didn't bring it up and you didn't call it to the judge's attention, okay? Failure to state how the actions and omissions taken by the court or department fail to satisfy what is required in the statutes or case law which requires you to open up the code and read to the judge what you're supposed to do, what the department is supposed to do, and what you're supposed to find. Okay, an example, the status review report is untimely or it regurgitates the same information from a previous report and doesn't have that many changes. This allows the parent a 10-day continuance, as you all know. Sometimes you're going so fast in court and you miss that. If I'm, if, I'm writing, I, I, if I'm writing a writ on other issues and I pick that up, I can't raise that in the writ because you didn't raise it down below. Going over to the next page. Forfeiture continued. What? Okay. All right. Forfeiture continued. What we all about? Okay. Failure to object to multiple unreasonable continuances, especially in Lancaster. You can't wait until year 20, um, you can't wait until month 27 of the no, case. No, you, you had it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how often do we see records that will be 14, 15 books long of all the reports dating back the last four or five years and you filed a notice of intent so that we can do what? Reunification services max out at 24 months. Tell your client. Just go ahead and tell them. Okay. If the case is being continued like DISPO, Lancaster, we know DISPO alone can go for maybe the whole 18 months. We can't do anything about your client not being serviced during that entire time, but maybe your senior too can. Go ahead with your question. Let's say you come to the case in one eight, and the attorneys that had it before you did not make that objection. Can I still object? Because it's new to me. I'm new to the case. Uh, can you repeat the question, if possible? Oh, okay. Um, we just got the question that if a new attorney to the case comes on at eight months and it's been getting continued and continued and none of the other attorneys ever said anything, should you object? First, I would talk to a supervisor and about the strategy there because there may be a reason why other people didn't say anything for all that time. However, what you should keep in mind is that you hurt our ability to argue for the client at the end of the case that this case has been getting disposed for the last 20 months and the client never got services because you all were, you know, prolonging dispo. And maybe your senior two could have filed an emergency writ, taking it up on appeal and challenging all those undue continuances. And all of those, those continuances, which at the end of the day, they are prejudicing your client. And then the more parents go to court, and then, they, and then they hear from the judge, come back in another three months, we can't hear your case today. 
parents are, a lot of parents are going to give up and they're going to stop coming. And so you go from having a parent who was willing in the beginning to a parent that's discouraged in the end. And there's not, not really anything that we can do about that. So failure to object to multiple unreasonable continuance is, continuances is huge. And there's nothing that we can do about it at the end of the game at 24, at 20, 30 months. 30 months in, there's nothing that we can do. If you haven't been setting up the record all along or fashioning some kind of strategy to attack uh, these judges continuing cases forever and ever. Okay. Failure to object to reasonable services finding and file a notice of appeal. That is a problem. That's an ongoing problem throughout LEO. I understand that. I didn't know either at the beginning. I did not know that we could appeal a reasonable services finding as long as our client services are getting continued. Okay, please know that. Please understand it. File that notice of appeal if you did not agree with that judge because what's going to happen is the court of appeal at the end is going to say to me, well, Ms. Ritt Attorney, you're, you're, you all have never complained about reasonable services until 18 months, you never said anything before. So why should we, that's N. Ray Earl L. right there. Okay, so you've got to be on top of that issue. And please know and be aware. All right, moving on. Okay, grounds for which writs are normally granted. Judicial error that results in prejudicial harm to a parent. Okay, so that doesn't mean the judge said one little thing wrong on the record. The Court of Appeal is going to help the trial judge out, okay? And it's going to start from a position of viewing the case in the light most favorable to the trial court. The other ground is lack of substantial evidence to support that reasonable services were provided to a parent. Like Frank already told you, switch your thinking in your final argument. Instead of talking about how great your, your parent is, oh, my parent has done her parenting classes, my mom has done half of her domestic violence, she's almost there, Your Honor. Instead of focusing on that, talk to the record, not the trial judge, and start weakening the trial court's reasoning. Start throwing out reasons for why the trial court is wrong. You're not talking to the trial court anymore. You're talking to the court of appeal now. Just like you're trying to persuade your parent that your little brother is the one who, you know, stole the cookie out of the jar and all the reasons why your mom should believe you, not your, not your little brother, that's, that's kind of the same concept here. To challenge the trial court on appeal, keep in mind the standard on appellate review is different than the burden of proof at trial, okay? At trial, the department has the burden of proof. On appeal, you have the burden of proof. Was there a question coming or no? Okay. On appeal, we have to prove to the court of appeal where the trial judge is wrong. So when you are making your record, remember, the court of appeal views the evidence most favorably to the trial court. Keep that in mind. There is no argument at the appellate level for that's not fair. Sorry. We don't get to use that one. You're going to have to be specific, and you're going to have to specifically pound away at the trial court's reasoning. You hear the burden of proof. You must overwhelmingly weaken the trial court's decision. Attack the department's inactions and failures. We don't see enough of that. Itemize all the things that should have happened and that didn't happen. Itemize it. I want to read more about what the department didn't do as opposed to what your client did do. Because if your client was doing stuff, we'll see that in the certificates. We hopefully will see it in the excellent testimony that we're going to hear from your client. But what I want to hear in your argument is you preserving those, issue, those issues by laying out in bullet point fashion. The department, NRA MF requires the department to do this. NRA TJ requires the department to do that. We didn't see that here, Your Honor. You don't have it, Your Honor. The evidence fails, Your Honor. You know what I hear a lot of? The evidence indicates, Your Honor. The evidence indicates. And on page six of the report, the report indicates. What does that mean, the report indicates? Okay, thank you. All right, what does that mean, the evidence indicates? No, I want to see where the evidence fails. You have got to, with a jackhammer, pound away at that substantial evidence. Because if you don't, the Court of Appeal 
it's pretty much going to go with the trial court unless you make it overwhelmingly clear why it should not. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let me see. Okay, don't forget. <laughs> Recite the statutory language verbatim and read it into the record. Don't just take county council's word for what the law is. You pull the code out and you read it into the record, okay? Talk to your supervisors while prepping your contest, not after. Don't, don't go to your supervisor after there's a problem. Talk to them beforehand, okay? Learn the family reunification timelines. Yes, they are challenging, but there are instances where pushing the time out long as possible does not work in your client's interest. Sometimes pushing, like I just described about Lancaster, Sometimes you let the case go on and on and on and you don't say anything because you think, hey, my client's getting more time. But what if your client isn't getting serviced? What if the social worker's not being held accountable? And now you're at 24 months and, and nothing, okay? If you know your client has no chance whatsoever on appeal, tell them. Show them the law. If the evidence shows that they should prepare for a 388, then point them in the direction of a 388 rather than holding out false hope. Best examples of records that resulted in successful risk granted for me, starting with attorney Sonia O'Quarry. Okay, that's right. Woo! Um, <laughs> 361.5A2B, not many people know about that. It is possible to terminate services re uh, under reunification early. It is possible without a 388. Most of the time, a court needs a 388 before the court. However, there are some other ways that, that a parent's reunification can be terminated early. A judge tried it, and Sonia was not having it, okay? She pulled open the statute, and she read what the, what the, what the standard was for terminating a parent's services before their time is up. There must be a failure to visit and contact. Mom had visited eight times, but Danette Gomez terminated services anyway. Sonia read the statute into the record. I rarely see that. I rarely see it. There was no, on every single writ I've ever had granted, there's never been any testimony. It's always because the judge made an error or the judge just wrote a, a, wrote a, a parent off and decided, this, this parent's not compliant, I'm just going to be lazy on this, whatever. And that's usually where I win when the judges get lazy. You have got to be paying attention and looking out for lazy judges. And thank, thank, thankfully enough here, Sonia did. Next example that I want to give of a successful writ, Attorney Bridget Dutra. She's not here today. Denial of a 2-1-E contest on reasonable services. Everybody in here understands that you're entitled to a contest, right? And to be heard on reasonable services, right? So it was crazy that Judge Natalie Stone denied a 2-1-E contest. Bridget Dutra, oh, I'm sorry, no, not Natalie Stone. It, yeah, it's Bridget Dutra. Bridget, I'm getting my trial words mixed up. It, it was Bridget Dutra that did that, I think. I think I might be getting my trial words mixed up. But it was denial of a 2-1-E contest. You have to make a record. You're not required to give um, an offer of proof for a 2-1-E contest. You're not required. If they want an offer of proof, you don't need to give one. Tell them that. You just preserved your issue just by saying that. Okay? So uh, that was when you say, I am not required to give one, that is an objection that's, that is sufficient to preserve the issue. Pointers for protecting your record and preserving issues for appeal. Uh, Frank and I already went over a majority of these. In your contest and argument, remember to talk to the record. Keep your argument tightly focused on legal error. Listen to the judge's findings. Judges become lazy when parents are non-compliant and they start taking shortcuts. However, parents are still entitled to have DCFS make an effort. Recite the actual statutory burdens of proof as they are written in the code. Learn the reunification time periods. Try to review the relevant code for your contest in advance. 
if you have a question about the code and what it says or what it means or how things work, don't struggle with it over court or rely on county council to explain it to you. Talk to a senior two or your supervisor in advance. Finally, call witnesses for a specific purpose only. The redditories cannot stress this enough. A lot of what we see in the record is trial lawyers calling witnesses and then asking questions that are kind of just all over the place. And we're trying to figure out what the point was of you calling this witness. How is that supposed to be helpful to me making a specific point concerning the evidence on appeal? Don't allow testimony to run amok. Set up your questions to target specific issues, visits, compliance, substantive progress, substantial risk of detriment, whatever your issue may be, your goal is to lay out your case to the Court of Appeal, not necessarily the trial judge. Uh, if Frank, do you want to close out with this, the last two down here, the bullet points? Sure. Uh, yeah, you should know the reason for every question that you're asking um, so that you know how to respond if someone objects. Uh, I've seen some crazy responses to objections. One attorney said, how are you going to, how are you going to sustain that objection? That's all I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait, I can't believe this. Like, you, I mean, it was a commissioner or something. No, I, that doesn't matter, right? You should always know why you're asking a question because... You can always be objected to for relevance, uh, hearsay, vague, lack of foundation. And a lot of the time, if you're just asking a rhythm question, that, that objection might have merit. Uh, second, like Shannon just said, the appellate attorney uh, needs to understand where you're going. How, how can we use that information? Um, you don't always have to have witness testimony. Um, and, Sometimes you do have to have witness testimony. It really depends on the case. But you don't have to have long testimony. I don't think, I think very rarely is that required as far as appeals are concerned. Um, I could see how it's, how it's very helpful in an E case or a D case at the trial level. But remember, our standard of proof is uh, substantial evidence, abuse of discretion, de novo. These are, these are standards that basically indicate that the trial court had to have royally screwed up with really no, like little to no justification for what they did. So it's a completely separate standard. Um, I want to end by by asking everyone if 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 they've seen Spider-Man: Homecoming. No, no. Not far from home. Homecoming, the the first one. I have. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, it just like it was a few years ago when it came out. Uh, so if you guys remember this movie, there's this. Uh, there's this fat Filipino kid in the movie that says, I want to be the guy in the chair. You guys, anybody, nobody remembers this? Has anyone seen The Matrix? Remember Mr. <laughs> Wizard? You know, Neo's running and goes, Mr. Wizard, I need an exit. You know, uh, I need to, it's the guy who sits at the computer that lets people out. Uh, of the Matrix. Uh, so basically what, I, my point is this. And I need to word this carefully because I talked to Ken about this. And, uh, <laughs> when you have questions, uh, you should go to your supervisors, your senior attorneys first. But if you have general questions uh, and they're not available, uh, and again, this has to be general because there may be a conflict of interest because any one of us can take the writ, technically speaking, uh, come to us. We can be the guy in the chair. We can be like Mr. Wizard. You know, like, you know, you're in court like, ah, I'm making this argument. Do you know any cases I could cite for this issue, for YTV? The, you know, there, there's there's no current risk, and you know I get that. And a helicopter comes to the top of the building. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like off, off the record, I get that for my friends. They they come, but you guys are all my friends. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like come to us if you have questions. Again, there's there's a uh, an order in which you're supposed to do it uh, according to Ken. Uh, but we're available. Uh, it's one of the aspects of the job that I like the most because I may not always have the answer readily available. But I'm at a computer, so I could just look it up immediately for you guys. So you have this resource. Uh, I think I'm speaking for all of the writ attorneys. We're, we're willing to do this for you guys. Okay, thanks. Thank you.